So as far as Leibniz is concerned, uh, Leibniz uh, had a background in philosophy and law. Uh, he was a, a diplomat, uh, and uh, it is as a diplomat that he visited uh, Paris during an extensive stay in Paris from 1672 to 1676. In Paris, Leibniz discovered mathematics. His mentor was Christian Huygens, who was in Paris as one of the most prominent members of the Parisian Academy of Science. Um, Leibniz read extensively in mathematics in Paris. He, you know, he was uh, uh, he was very good when he was in a library. <laughs> he could read tens and tens of books, and what is more important is that he could understand what was written in these books, and um, he read um, extensively in uh, mathematics. When he met Huygens in Paris, Huygens was uh, made Leibniz aware of the fact that he didn't know the new mathematics, that he had to do a lot of work. And that's what Leibniz did. The manuscripts that Leibniz left, uh, that uh, are still, um, uh, that are extant of his uh, mathematical studies in Paris, reveal that uh, via a very personal uh, path of discovery, he reached a result, a calculus, a method, I would say, that uh, in some sense is equivalent to Newton's. Leibniz called this method the differential and then integral calculus. Integral is a term that Johann Bernoulli suggested to him. So when uh, we read uh, the end result of the Parisian period in 1676, when we read what Leibniz had achieved in 1675-1676, as modern mathematical readers we feel at home because he is using a notation that is still in use and um, because his way of presenting the calculus is similar to what we read in a modern textbook, in a way. Whereas what Newton does is less familiar, let us say so. A characteristic of Leibniz's calculus that I would like to underline is that uh, he stated from the very beginning the basic rules of the differential calculus as we would do nowadays. So we have the differential of the product, the differential of a sum, the differential of the quotient, and so on and so forth. He was quite interested in formulating an efficient notation and in stating from the very beginning the basic rules of these symbols. If we compare this to Newton, we find that Newton was less good as, a sim as an inventor of symbols. He was not bad. I mean, his symbols are interesting. And the but um, his notation is a bit clumsy, let us say so, especially his early notation. Because Newton in the 90s developed a notation in which he used dots to denote fluxions, such as uh, x with an over dot is the fluxion of x, x with two dots is the fluxion of the fluxion of x, so the second fluxion of x and so on and so forth. Leibniz had uh, 
uh, a better notation, uh, was more interested in stating from the very beginning the rules to which the symbols had to obey. And his symbols, the D, the familiar D, and the familiar long S for the integral, suggests in a more vivid way the idea that this operation, that these symbols represent operations, if you like. So um, we consider, when we read Leibniz, we feel that Leibniz is closer to modern mathematics because uh, of this idea of the symbol D and S as operator that act on magnitudes. Now, I sometimes think that this impression is uh, somehow an historical artifact. I sometimes feel that we modernize Leibniz a little bit, exactly because his notation was the one that was adopted later. So it might well be that we read Leibniz with uh, the benefit of hindsight. Because if we consider Leibniz's notation, we find that he is always careful, for instance, in uh, the geometrical dimension of the magnitudes that he manipulates. So if he has a magnitude that represents an area, he will not write that this area is equal to x and that the differential of this area is equal to dx. He will write a time x, where a is a constant that is introduced there because if you are talking about an area, you need uh, something that has two dimensions. And the differential of this area will be a times dx. The fact that Leibniz and his followers were so careful about the geometrical dimensions of the magnitudes that they were handling is uh, perhaps an indication that uh, their calculus was endowed of a geometrical interpretation in their mind, so to speak. Leibniz visited London on diplomatic missions, one once in 1673 and another one, another time in October 1676. This second visit is interesting because it occurs during this correspondence with Newton. Leibniz and Newton did not meet but Leibniz met a work by Newton in the archive of the Royal Society. John Collins showed him the De Analisi. Uh, but from the annotations that Leibniz left, it seems that Leibniz was interested only in the part of the anal De Analisi that deals with infinite series, with the development of infinite series. The part of the De Analisi that deals with quadratures and uh, with topics more related with the, the, the method of fluxions were less interesting for him, for the very good reason that he had already developed the differential and the integral calculus by himself. When I say that the De Analisi contains bits of the method of fluxions, I am not endorsing a philo Newtonian theory, because you know the De Analisi is circulated, and if we say that the De Analisi contains uh, the fluxional method, we are saying that the fluxional method were, was circulating freely. It does, however, contains bits of the methods, uh, very important bits of the method of fluxions. It contains a proof of the fundamental theorem. And it contains also the use of the so-called characteristic triangle, that is the infinitesimal triangle, that is formed when you have a curve, you have a, an infinitesimal arc of the curve, 
and then you have the infinitesimal increment of the abscissa and the infinitesimal increment of the ordinate. This little triangle uh, is appears in the De, De Analisi and is uh, used in order to rectify curves, for instance.